Welcome to Keep It Fictional, the book podcast by book lovers for book lovers. Now, as we approach Canadian Thanksgiving, the question of gratitude becomes one we're more preoccupied with. What are we thankful for? Is it family? Friends? A good job? A roof over our heads? There are so many things that we can be thankful for. But this Thanksgiving season, my book friends and I are going to talk about authors we are thankful for. I'm excited to find out who my book friends are thankful for and why they're thankful for those authors. So let's get into it. I think we're going to start with Virginia today. Who have you got for us? All right. So the first author that came to mind when I saw this topic was no, La Vie Tihar. Um, and I have alluded to this author before a number of times on this podcast, but I've never talked about one of his books at length. So this is the perfect episode to induce, introduce you to this amazing author if you have not encountered his works before. Now, just a bit about Tihar first. He is an Israeli-British author born in Israel and then lived in many places, including South Africa, the UK, Laos, and Vanuatu. In 1998, he published his first book, which is a collection of poetry, which he hasn't done since then. But, you know, he does sneak in poetry every now and then into his books. In 2010, he wrote his first debut novel, um, which turns into a trilogy. It is a steampunk series called The Book Man. And then in 2011, he wrote Osama, which he described as a film noir Nonfiction, alternative history, and international thriller. And that book won him the World Fantasy Award. He went on to create many award winners and nominees, including Best Novella for uh, in 2012, British Fantasy Award for Goro and the Pot Belly God. Um, he won a John Campbell Memorial Award for Best Science Fiction Novel in 2017 for Central Station. And he wrote many, many other books, including A Man Lies Dreaming, which he pitched to his agent as Adolf Hitler, Private Eyed, which made his agent laugh and told him, yeah, no one is going to buy that, but sure, go ahead and write it. Um, and he did, and somebody did buy it, thankfully. Um, he wrote a retelling of the Jesus story, but Jesus now knows Kung Fu. So he wrote Jesus and the Eightfold Path. He wrote The Big Blind, which is a about a poker playing nun. And he has a hundred more short stories published in prints and online science fiction and fantasy magazines. He had a graphic novel series called Adler. He has a kid's book called Candy or in the US, The Candy Mafia. He also has a weekly column that he writes uh, a short story in uh, one of the daily paper in Vanuatu in uh, Blislama, which is his third language, the official language of the island. He has an animation studio that does studio and games. He has a share column in the Washington Post with Silvia Moreno Garcia that recommends science fiction, fantasy, and horror stories. This person is like unstoppable. And I got to wonder, do you sleep? at all because I don't know how you can come up with so many things and just he has his hands in everything it's amazing my first La Vitida book um, my first introduction to him was uh, By Force Alone which is a retelling of a King Arthur story now I don't care about King Arthur at all and I don't think he does either <laughs> Um, but when he was forced to read uh, some King Arthur stories, he was just like, he realized that this alleged tale of honor and chivalry is awful. These people are like gangsters. They're like awful, awful people. So he ended up write, rewriting it in a Godfather Scarface style. And that's what he got by force alone. Um, I was really intrigued by just the way he retelled the story, by his writing. It's just so much fun. And and as usual, most of his stories has like a political bent in it, which I really enjoy. And so I went on to read some of his older works, um, which I picked up Central Station, which I think is probably his more uh, well-known novel. Um, and it's quite different, very different from By Force Alone. This is definitely a fairy science fiction, science fiction. Um, and it's kind of my entry into 
maybe for lack of a better term, like more thoughtful science fiction. Um, I was very much a space opera person, but this book kind of made me look at some other different kinds of science fiction stories, um, which um, I'm really thankful for. Um, and then, you know, I've been trying to keep up with Tirar, as mentioned, he has, he's so prolific. He just writes so much stuff. Um, so it's hard to keep up with him. Also, the fact that he is UK based, which means many of his books are not always available immediately here to us, which is annoying. Um, but yeah, I um, one of my favorite of his book is probably The Escapement, which came out a couple of years ago. It's a really, really touching story about the length a father would go to for his son. But as he said, he also called this a clown western <laughs> because this is a book about set in sort of a western kind of world with clowns. <laughs> How do you make a story with clowns a heartfelt story? That is only something that Tidar can do. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, and as his website said, you know, he works across genres. He combined detective and thriller modes with poetry, science fiction, and historical and autobiographical material. And he always ends up setting some of his books in places that I don't usually represent in science fiction, which I really, really appreciate. Great. There is more. Because Tidar is not just my favorite, one of my favorite author, um, and it's just a genius, as Daryl Gregory called him. But there's another reason why I'm talking about him today on this kind of Thanksgiving theme kind of episode. is because in addition to being an amazing author, he is also a tireless advocate for science fiction and fantasy authors and stories from all over the world. It's always a delight to find that an author is also an avid reader, that they're not just passionate about the craft of writing, but they're also really passionate and excited when they read stories and books that by other people that they love. And, and Tidar is definitely an avid reader, and he wants you and me to know about all these great authors that may not have had the exposure that they deserve yet in sort of North America, in the UK. And he wanted to bring these people to our attention. So he is also the editor of numerous anthologies to highlight that global science fiction and fantasy scene. In 2009, he started his first volume of the Apex Book of World Science Fiction, which has comes in five volumes. And of course, he is also the author um, of two soon-to-be three volumes, the third volume coming out in December, of the Best of World SF. And this all came in the bit, it's sort of like when he recognized the kind of the irony of how, you know, there was this thing called the Worldcon, um, which started in 1939 in New York, a small science fiction fan convention that happened to take place in during the World's Fair. And so they, they call it the Worldcon. But then, of course, he realized that, that this so-called Worldcon really is just Anglo-American. Like there is no world in this Worldcon at all. It's not until 2015 when an award that they give out actually went to a novel that is not originally published in English. So because of that, he he tried to like pitch to publishers just this idea of like, let's make an anthology of international speculative fiction. Let's, let's put that out there. But of course, like, you know, either he get no response from publishers or like one time he said he got and respond a no, a rejection, like in under an hour. And he was just like, yeah, people are not interested, which of course makes him really angry. Um, but, you know, so he persevered and he finally has all these different anthologies out. All the stories are personally chosen by uh, La Vitida, um, and it includes um, some authors that now are a little bit more, were more well-known, like Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, San Cho, Aliette Debo, Tate Thompson, many of the authors that we mentioned on this show before, but also many authors that write um, some in English and many of them translated. And he also makes sure that the authors and the translators, they both get paid the same because he recognized how important for both of them to make these stories available to us. So I am just so grateful, I think, for him for being this proponent of stories from around the world and just giving everybody that coverage and that boost. Like, I just think this is someone who just does it all. So for this episode, I got caught up on some of his other books. Um, and uh, I want to talk about today is his latest, uh, one of his latest, because another one, of course, not available yet here, but he has like not one, but two books out this year. Um, but the one that um, just came out in the beginning of September is The Circumference of the World by Lavi Tidar. Now, Tida said that this book was inspired by a what-if question. What if L. Ron Hubbard was right? 
what if a pulp science fiction writer who is also, of course, a founder of a very questionable church is right about some stuff, like right about the origins of the universe and right about the beginning of humanity. So that is what this story is kind of centered around, a pulpy science fiction novel that may or may not exist. It's called Load Stars and it's by Eugene Charles Hartley. And this book allegedly exists, but not many people have seen it. Not many people have owned it. And it is a book that in this novel, for at least four people are looking for. First, we have Dahlia, who's born on uh, Venunatu, and then he, she moved to London and married a fellow mathematician named Levi. Levi is sure that his career is coming to an end because all famous mathematicians discover what made them famous before they turn 30. And Levi is almost 30. So he is very upset. He's depressed. And he became obsessed with finding the thing that will make his career. And he believes that it is this book called Low Star by Eugene Charles Hartley. He's convinced that Hartley has indeed discovered the nature of the universe, the mystery. And he has encoded what he knows in his book. If only Levi could get a copy, then he can decode this mystery and that would be his contribution to science. And weirdly, Delia sort of remembers seeing maybe a copy of this book on, you know, like in her childhood home, in her childhood home on the island. She kind of remembers it. And of course, Levi just couldn't believe that his wife actually has once upon a time held a copy of this book. Then Levi disappeared and he went missing. Now, Delia knows that it must have something to do with this book. So she hires someone to look for Levi. She wants him to come home, of course, but, you know, really, just as long as he's okay, she will. She just wants to know that he is doing okay, and that will be enough for her. But instead of hiring a detective, she decides to hire Daniel Chase, who is a rare bookseller, who keeps reminding her that, like, I don't look for missing people, I look for books. But Delia thinks that he is the right person for the job. But then before Daniel could begin, he was kidnapped by Oscar Lance, a billionaire who's also looking for the novel. And Oscar Lance believes that this book, Low Star, is not just a book, but it's a device, what he called the occlusion device. And somehow this book, this device, is going to help prevent him from being devoured by these aliens or these what they call the eaters, another theory that Hartley proposed in his book and his church. So once again, you got Tidar who combines all these weird, unrelated threads. We have a story about a missing person, a mysterious rare book that may or may not exist playing homage to like the golden age science fiction writers and this church of all seeing eyes and then the meaning of the universe. Everything combined all of this into a strange but intriguing story that calls to the question, what is reality and what do we really know about it? I just love all the banana pants theories in the book, which of course end up being true. What if it's true? Um, and the story is structured in a way that you get like all the different points of view and we sort of move from one part of the story to the other with Dahlia in her, in her childhood and then her in London and then Daniel, the rare bookseller, Oscar, and also in the end, Hartley, the author of Low Stars, who hangs out and in conversation with some of his peers, who include some real science fiction authors like Heinlein and Frederick Poe. It is so much fun and it's, of course, told in Tidar's like, signature, very poetic, very sparse kind of prose. And as usual, when you open up a Tidar book, you just never know what you're going to get. Um, and as Ian Madonna said, he's like a, a genre entirely on his own. And NPR said he's a genius as conjuring realities that are just two steps to the left of our own. It's always very sci-fi, but it's also like really like our real world. It's just like it's strange, but also kind of realistic at the same time. It's just, it's, it's something 
it's just a special, special author that does something really special every time he writes. And so I am so, so thankful for all the amazing work that you do, Lavi Tidar. Um, and I think for anyone who is intrigued by, you know, like what this author is all about, I would say just, um, I don't know if there's a book that is like the best book to strive with. Like he has a massive catalog for you to pick from, but I would say like pick the the premise that interests you because he has so many strange premises that all sound really, really interesting. Pick the one that interests you and you would just, you never know what you're going to find. And I think that is one of some of the fun about reading his book. So um, like I said, his latest, The Circumference of the World, and that is uh, by Lavi Tidar. Thank you, Virginia. That is that sounds fantastic. And I think I just added another couple books to my TBR. So next we've got Sadie. Sadie, who are you thankful for today? All right. So I actually I'm gonna start again. I think I made a weird scratching sound. Um so yeah, I actually really struggled with this topic. Um, I feel like a lot of the authors that I really, really love and I'm really, really thankful for, I've already talked about um, pretty much all of their books. And even if I hadn't talked about one of their books, I, I probably didn't need to bring another Kelly Armstrong or another Lee Bardugo book onto this show. It's just not, not necessary. I have sold enough books for them and they don't need the publicity anymore. Uh, so the book that I did end up picking um, was actually one that I didn't consider for quite a while because I thought I'd already talked about it. Um, and I was like racking my brain trying to figure out when I had talked about this, why why it was not listed on our list of books that we talked about, why I could not fi kind of figure out when it was. And what I can figure out now, I think it must have been for one of our Booktoberfest or readathons. And I mentioned it in like just a quick kind of this is what I'm going to be reading for this readathon or for for Booktoberfest. So I did not have not done a full talk about this book. So I'm very excited to talk about it today. Um and uh I I absolutely love this book. I'll get into that a little bit after I do the review of it. Um but um the author that I'm going to be talking about is Julie Kagawa. And uh, Julie Kagawa is a Japanese American young adult writer. She is most uh, well known actually for her Iron Fae series. And that's a very, very uh, big series. I think there's 15 novels and novellas involved in it. It's quite uh, it's quite a large series. Um, and it revolves around a teenage girl who learns that she's actually the daughter of a fairy king and is being used as a pawn in a deadly war. Um, I actually just started reading that one. Um, I was going, I consider talking about it for this episode um, and I started reading it and I think I will finish it, but uh, it didn't kind of hook me as much as uh, the book that I'm going to talk about did. Um, and I, I was really happy when I saw this book um, because I had looked into Julie Kagawa's work before and it did revolve a lot around the Fae, which is not always my favorite kind of trope or theme in YA uh, fiction. There's a lot of YA stuff that's written about the Fae um, and it's not my favorite. Um, so I I'd kind of avoided <laughs> avoided that series. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I have to interrupt. It's not your favorite. Favorite. <laughs> um, so Julie Kagawa, uh, apart from the Iron Fae series, does actually have quite a few um, other series. Uh, she has The Blood of Eden, which is sort of a post-apocalyptic vampire story. Um, and there are four books in that series. Uh, she has the Talon series, which is a dragon-focused um, series. She has uh, five books in that series. And then the series that I am going to be talking about, there are three books. I wish that there were more uh, because I just absolutely love the world that she creates. I absolutely love the characters that she creates. Um, and I just, I really want wanted more in that world and wanted more um, to kind of read about. Uh, so the book that I am going to be talking about today is The Shadow of the Fox by Julie Kagawa. And The Shadow of the Fox starts one thousand years ago in the land of Iwagato. The holder of the scroll of a thousand prayers has summoned the great Kami dragon. When the dragon is summoned, he will grant the holder one wish. The holder wishes for power and control. 
And as a result, Iwagato is plunged into a time of chaos and destruction for many, many years. Eventually, the people of Iwagato find a tentative peace and continue on with their lives. And while no one ever really forgets about the dark times, the Great Kami Dragon and the Scroll of a Thousand Prayers are turned more into a legend than into an actual reality or history. However, there are some who have never forgotten what has happened. And so to prevent the same thing from happening again, they split the Scroll of a Thousand Prayers into three pieces, hiding each piece in a different secret location across the world. But it is almost time for the great Kami Dragon to rise again. And those who seek to claim the wish for themselves will not let anything or anyone stand in their way. All of this, however, doesn't really mean much to Yumeko. She's heard the legends of the dragon and the wish, of course. She actually knows the stories really, really well. Um, her teachers and her adopted family, uh, the monks at the Silent Wind Temple, have made sure of this. They've made sure that she's studied the stories. She knows the history. But myths and legends about thousand-year-old wishes, they're not really that fun. And Yumeko would much rather sneak around the temple getting into trouble. Because Yumeko loves mischief. She loves to get into trouble. It's it's kind of just in her nature, and she struggles not, uh, not to get into trouble. Because Yumeko is not entirely human. Yumeko is half human and half kitsune, which is a fox yokai or demon. Now, while Yumeko looks mostly human, she does have some fox features, as well as a fox's love of mischief and a power over illusions. Now, Master Asai, who has often warned her to keep her kitsune abilities hidden, uh, tells her that not everyone will look kindly on the fact that she's half demon. So Yumeko spends her time in the temple doing her best to hide that side of her and more often than not just playing pranks of illusion on the monks around her. Cage Tatsumi has been trained as a weapon for the Shadow Clan. He's been taught to kill. He's been taught to have no emotions because emotions mean weakness. And if Cage shows any weakness inside or out, then he will never stand a chance against the greatest threat that he faces. The threat that he carries with him every single day of his life in a very literal way. The threat is the sword that he carries, that he has been trained to carry and trained to use, a sword that imbues him with incredible strength and fighting ability that allows him to kill most yokai and demons that he comes across. And the reason that it does this is because the sword is actually inhabited by a very powerful demon itself, a demon which has the ability to take over Cage's mind and soul if he ever lets it. And so, to protect himself, he buries all of his emotions and acts as the perfect demon-killing machine that he was created to be. The lives of Yumeko and Cage should probably never have crossed paths. And a hundred years earlier, they probably wouldn't have. However, as the time of the Great Kami Dragon approaches, everything begins to change. Yumeko is out in the forest that surrounds the temple when... She smells smoke. She rushes back home to find that the only home she has ever known is burning, burning to the ground. As she rushes closer, she realizes not only is the temple on fire, but it is actually under attack by the most gruesome and biggest demon that Yumeko has ever laid eyes on. Using the only power she has, the power of illusion, she sneaks inside of the temple and finds Master Asao and the rest of the monks fighting there for their lives. As she tries to figure out how she can help them, Master Asao pulls her aside, and in a rush, he tells her that the myth myths that she's heard her whole life are real, and that the Silent Winds Temple is one of the three hiding spots for the Scroll of a Thousand Prayers. This piece of the scroll must be protected at all costs, 
and it is now up to Yumeko to be its protector and to deliver it safely to another temple where it can be hidden once again. Nisao has just enough time to thrust the scroll into Yumeko's hands before he is killed. Yumeko runs, leaving behind the only home and the only family that she has ever known to be burned to the ground. She runs and she runs out of the burning temple into the forest and quite literally right into Cage Tatsumi. Now, Cage had been sent to the temple to retrieve the scroll. He was going to take it by force if necessary. But when he arrives, he realizes that he is too late. Now, having no one else in the world, Yumeko knows that she will never make it safely to the Steel Feather Temple on her own. And so she makes a deal with Cage. She doesn't tell him that she has the scroll, but she tells him that she knows where it is. And if he helps her and protects her on the way to the temple, then she will tell him where the scroll is and he can have it. Oblivious to the fact that Yumeko herself is carrying the scroll, Cage agrees, and the two set off on a journey across Yuagato, filled with dangers, a lot of lies, a lot of demons, and some weird unknown power that is kind of controlling the situation, but no one really knows exactly what it is or exactly how much of the situation is uh, being controlled by it. So that is The Shadow of the Fox by Julie Kagawa. It is the first book in a trilogy. Um, I think that without giving too much away, the ending of this trilogy affected me more than I thought it would. I hated it and I loved it all at the same time. <laughs> um, it's worth it. I think that it is It is worth reading through because it is. the characters are so fun the characters are so nuanced they have kind of all these different parts to them um i loved the incorporation of the japanese myths and legends and uh, the japanese language into the story um i read one review that said uh, kagawa never apologizes or takes unnecessary time to explain the use of um the japanese words that she includes um she doesn't kind of try to handhold people through um, the unknown language. She just puts it into the book um, as if it's meant to be there and and it works so well. And if kind of if the reader is curious about what that specific word means, um, then it's up to us to kind of go and figure figure that out and look it up. And and I think that that language edition just added so much to the story. Um, it was a part of the world that I've always been really interested in and a part of mythology that I've always been really interested in. I've read a little bit about Japanese mythology, um, but not a lot. Um, and I know, um, I believe that some uh, people on their podcast are quite, uh, quite versed in uh, Japanese history and knowledge. Um, and so I might, uh, I might talk to them at some point about, uh, about more, more information as well. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love the book. I, wish that there was more as i said i just wish that she wrote more in this world and kind of in this mythology because it's so rich and there's so much to it um the character of yumeko is very sympathetic and 